Before a living being encounters trauma, it is in a state of cohesion. We could say that he or she is in a state of oneness and experiences integration and wholeness within him or herself. Trauma, by definition, is an experience that causes distress that cannot be resolved. Now, trauma goes far beyond what we normally think of as trauma, things like wars and sexual abuse. Trauma includes things that we would consider mundane. It's a trauma to be born in our mainstream medical facilities today. It's a trauma to be weaned. It's a trauma to feel extreme jealousy when there's no way to resolve that situation when you're six or seven. These traumas almost all of us experience, no, not almost all of us experience, and yet we don't consider them traumas. The problem is that if we don't have a way to resolve and thus integrate a trauma we experience when we're young, we must dissociate from it. Consciousness itself functions like water. Therefore, you can imagine the dissociation process as it occurs within consciousness by thinking about a river. If you're looking at a river from above, you can see that the larger river often branches off into smaller rivers, and each time this happens, there is less water available to the main river. At the moment of trauma, when we dissociate, part of our consciousness branches off from our main consciousness, just like this river. Our consciousness splits, just like the river does. It is an act of self-preservation. It's easier to comprehend how this process of our consciousness splitting affects us when we picture it in terms of how it impacts our personality. We have to imagine that by splitting, we fragment our ego. Now I'm gonna help you understand this in a really easy way. I want you to imagine, as is accurate, that you have one body. But you usually think you have one personality too that kind of resides in and of this body and uses it. But when splitting occurs, that's not what's actually happening. Internally, your personality becomes split kind of like Siamese twins. So if you don't know, Siamese twins are conjoined twins. They share the same body and yet they have two totally distinct personalities. We may have hundreds of these Siamese twins internally. <laughs> so technically they're all conjoined because they all share one body, your body, but each one has its own identity, its own desires, needs, perspectives, strengths, weaknesses, and appearance. For example, inside my body, I could have an aspect of myself that's a warrior princess, one that's like a male war admiral, one that's like a tiny crying child, one that's a queen, one that's a cat, one that's an extraterrestrial, one that's a demon. Some might even be able to give me names for themselves if I ask them to. There's really no limit to how many can be inside a person. I've seen as little as three and as many as hundreds. And each one has an opposite. In the moment of trauma, there's a split between the vulnerable self and the self that coped with that vulnerability so as to self-preserve. The mistake that we make within society is that we don't think that people have multiple personalities. They do. We reserve those types of labels, the dissociative identity disorder and so forth, for people that are so dysfunctional with their multiple personalities that they'll walk up to you one minute and say, hi, I'm Nancy. The next minute they'll be like, I don't know who you're talking to, I'm three. Now people who dissociate to that degree, we say they have multiple personality disorder, but here's the thing. There is not a single person on the face of this planet that doesn't have multiple personalities. The question is, to what degree? I know you may be resisting this concept, but stick with me for a minute. How many times have you said that somebody has multiple sides to them? How many times have you said somebody seems like Jekyll and Hyde? How many times do you yourself feel torn between making a decision and making another decision? These are all examples of circumstances that come about as a result of a conflict between our Siamese twins within. Now here's something huge. Our degree of internal suffering is about the degree of harmony or lack thereof between these internal selves. Our world is a reflection of our internal state as human beings. Now look at our world. Not one day goes by that someone isn't declaring war with someone else, there isn't some kind of genocide, there isn't slaughterhouses, somebody isn't hating someone else, someone isn't denying the fact that something exists. So naturally, not a day goes by that that type of interaction isn't happening inside us as well. Until we reintegrate, just like the world, there is always some personalities within us that love other personalities within us, some that hate others, some that protect others, some that want to control others, some that won't acknowledge the existence of others, and some that don't even know that others exist. So you know how I said that within us, this Siamese twin kind of splitting process, there's always a personality 
to the opposite of each other. Almost like there's always, when you create black, there's always one that is created that's white. So in the moment of trauma, you fragment between the self that is vulnerable and the self that protects the vulnerable self. Now here's super, super important information. We always identify with the protector aspect of the personality. So this would be the Siamese twin that was protecting our vulnerability. And that's who we actually think our personality is. So this is where I'm about to break it to you, that your personality is completely fake. It doesn't matter how much you think it's real. What it is is an amalgamation of the personalities that kept you safe in your specific circumstance in your childhood. For example, given my career, you can see that I've identified with the aspect of myself that's a knower and a teacher worldwide. Perhaps this aspect of me that understands everything was created to cope with a blindsiding trauma that I didn't understand. Perhaps within me, therefore, is an aspect, an inner child self even, that is terrified and confused and that quite literally just does not understand what is happening. In other words, we come in with raw potential, but that raw potential is sorted out. We basically identify with the personalities that kept us safe and suppress, deny, reject, and disown any of the aspects of us or personality subtypes that didn't keep us safe, that hold our vulnerability. Now the problem with denying, rejecting, and disowning things is what? Eventually the brain goes, I don't want to deal with this because obviously focusing on it isn't getting me anywhere and if we're going to deny, reject, disown it and everything else, then why not just become unaware of it? Let's make it subconscious. So those aspects of your personality spectrum, we could call them those personalities within you, are totally unknown to you, even though they may be completely obvious to everyone around you. Fragmentation is a function of consciousness, and consciousness is everything. So if you understand the concept of, of God itself, which is everythingness being a conscious thing, that means there's consciousness in your bathroom door. That means there's consciousness in every different aspect of your body. There's consciousness everywhere. And so anything can potentially fragment. Now I want you to think about how this applies to the body because one of the primary reasons for disease within the human body or not even just human body, any body, animal, plant, whatever, is also fragmentation. I'll give you an example of what I mean. Let's say that there's a woman who's experienced sexual trauma in her childhood. That trauma caused her womb itself to go into a state of fragmentation. So the consciousness of her ovaries is different than the consciousness of her fallopian tubes, is different than the consciousness of her womb, is different than the consciousness of her vagina. So let's imagine that she is infertile, but the doctors can't find any physical reason for that. If we imagine her ovaries are like mini cells that can talk to us, they might say, I don't want a baby. Everything precious gets taken away from me. This might be enough for the body to simply not produce viable eggs. In another woman with the same issue, this overlying issue with the consciousness of the ovaries might turn into polycystic ovarian syndrome, where the body is literally holding onto and not releasing its eggs. If we talk to the uterus in this very same woman, it might feel emotionally warm and nurturing and say, I'm so excited to create life, I'm ready. If we talk to her cervix, it might violently say, fuck you, nothing's getting through me ever again. The cervix now is serving as a protector against everything, including sperm. As you can see, only one part of many actually wants the baby, and so all of her energy is not actually aligned with conceiving a child, even though this woman could consciously look at you and say that it's the one thing she wants in her life more than anything else. Everything has consciousness, and so everything can be talk to you as if it is an individual self, so as to understand it, know it, feel it, meet its needs, and do anything we can so that it becomes a part of the bigger whole in a more harmonious way. There are several strategies that we can use to reintegrate fragmented aspects within our being that happen as a result of trauma, but first I suggest becoming aware of them in the first place. And to do this, you have to notice when there are shifts energetically that occur within your personality, within the way you feel, and within the way you're presenting yourself to the world. Now, I'm gonna demonstrate it in this way. I want you to imagine that this glass represents your body. Now, when we encounter the external world or circumstances in the external world, we tend to experience what I call a takeover of one of these personalities, usually the protector personalities within our personality spectrum. One of our Siamese twins basically seizes control of the body. So let's say that 
you're standing in line and somebody in that same line gets angry and starts yelling. Now you feel a complete energetic shift within you. You start standing differently. You start to feel armored. What's happened in this moment is that that Siamese twin that's in charge of protecting you in that moment seizes control of the body and now you're basically acting like that protector personality, whatever it acts like. Maybe it's more like a football player and it's gonna be tough, its voice is low, it doesn't have an issue with conflict, it's gonna deal with it directly, right? Now let's say in another scenario, let's say that same person, you go home, right? And the minute you walk in the door, you feel calmer. Maybe you see your wife when you walk through the door and suddenly the energetic shift that happens within you is you feel young, suddenly you're feeling vulnerable about the situation that you just went through. This is a takeover of another personality subtype. Maybe this is your inner child that sees mommy in your wife and goes, oh, I just want to be touched and held right now. And you're kind of going, wow, how can all this be happening within me? I'm one person, right? Now, let's say that in another circumstance, let's say that you have to take a test. Suddenly you're feeling like a total brainiac. Suddenly you can access the part of you that's like really, 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 really smart. And even it feels like your body might change. So you might feel tall and skinny, whereas before you felt like a football player. This is a takeover of another Siamese twin with a totally different identity. Even though you are not aware of its name right now, it's a different personality subtype that has taken over so as to perform the job to the best of its ability of taking the test. That is just us meeting with three different personality subtypes. We can use the awareness of this happening within us to figure out which personality we're experiencing and also what's to the opposite side of that. So for example, let's say that in a moment I'm in a war general personality to the opposite of that may be a daisy flower personality. <laughs> One method we can use is to close our eyes and ask to see this part of ourselves in our mind's eye. We then let the image appear however it appears. If it helps us, we can see if this part in us has a name. We can begin to observe it and study its behaviors and perspectives and wants and needs and motivations. We can ask it any kind of questions. We can explore its relationship with other parts within us. This is in fact roughly the strategy used by methods like inner child work and parts work and voice dialogue and internal family systems therapy. If you're interested in getting more help to explore your own fragmentation and to create further integration, then I suggest that you take it into your own hands to seek out some of these therapies if you want to. They can be extremely beneficial for people. But as you know, I like to turn it up a few notches. So I'm going to expose to you another way to experience your internal Siamese twins. <laughs> Everything in this universe is made of consciousness, like I said before, and consciousness does not get destroyed. Now what a method actor in Hollywood knows that other people don't know is that acting can go far beyond pretending. You can actually take on the consciousness of something completely by letting go first of whatever consciousness you have now. Another aggressive way of putting this is I can let go of Teal Swan so as to literally allow the consciousness of something else into my embodiment. Now when this occurs in the spiritual field, we call it possession. A method actor is going into a state of willing possession when they're in their roles. They are literally becoming it, it is not pretend. And as a result, the point of attraction changes around them, and that's often why they die after their most difficult and darkest roles. When we are pretending, we're experiencing something through the filter of our own consciousness. But what a method actor is doing is removing this filter entirely. Now, why is a method actor able to do this so easily when it would be difficult for some of us? It's because their level of identification is so very weak. To be aggressive, I'm just gonna say, they have identity disorders. The majority of people who are really awesome actors in Hollywood have a very, very limited grasp on their own sense of self and identity. So they're able to just let it go and take on something else. Really beneficial if you wanna make millions of dollars in Hollywood. <laughs> but in day-to-day -day life, it can present some issues. However, all people can actually learn to do this and you can do it in a way that benefits you. It is also possible to split our consciousness intentionally so that part of us is experiencing a possession state and another part is witnessing ourselves experiencing the possession state. That's perhaps a more safe way to go about it. <laughs> Intentional possession can be used as a tool to understand anything that is hidden in the subconscious mind. It can also be used to heal 
the relationship between disintegrated parts of yourself. There are many other applications for this, but I'm not going to be going into them in this video because several of them are too dangerous for the, let's call it, average citizen to be using. Instead, I'm going to give you a safe version of how to use this technique. For example, using the previous analogy, you could decide to allow the consciousness of your left ovary to take over your body. You can state internally to yourself, or choose with your intention, I accept to become my left ovary. Then what you do is to surrender. Like you let go of the concept, if I was doing it, of teal swan, and you allow the energy that is in your left ovary to take over your entire body, almost like it's filling in all of the spaces. So you are now your ovary. That means that when you talk now or write, you will be talking or writing in I. But I no longer being teal swan, I being the ovary. Don't think about the answers that you're giving. You want this to be more like a stream of consciousness exercise, where basically, without thinking, you're just answering. So you could have other people ask you questions, or you could ask yourself questions. You could write them down and answer them as your right ovary, your left ovary. That's the type of exercise that you want to do. Now, if you don't want to be the one that's being willingly possessed, what you can do is ask somebody else who wants to, to play that part of you for you. So they could become your left ovary, and then you could have a conversation with your own left ovary. Think about how incredible your awareness of this aspect of yourself could be if you started talking to it like that. Know that anything that is said or felt during this exercise is valid and has appeared for an important reason. What you have to understand is that if somebody else accepts the possession state of that part of you, you have to watch them with the attitude of whatever is being said is directly being said by this part of me. Now, it's really, really common that when we see aspects of ourselves that are buried in our subconscious mind, our first reaction is usually to reject, deny, and disown it, and basically push it away and say, I don't know how that's true for me. This is not your job in this exercise. Your job is to see how is this true for me? How is this true for me? Assuming it is true, how could this be true for me? When you are done, you can internally state to yourself with your intention or to the other person if they're the one doing it, I now release myself from being my left ovary, or I now release you from being my left ovary. And what you can do to help yourself come back is to re-own your personality. So I'd say, okay, I now re-own my personality as Teal Swan. It is 2017 or whatever year it is. I am in this place. I am this many years old. This is what I do for a living, kind of recalibrating to your personality. Make sure when you do this that you don't do it with the attitude that any part of you is bad or has to change or that it must unify with other parts because all of this is resistance to individual parts. It is disapproval for their fragmentation and I can tell you they had good reason to do so. You want to do this with the attitude of compassionately and genuinely wanting to understand it so that you can better meet its needs and bring it closer to yourself rather than pushing it away from yourself. The goal of reintegration is not to force these fragmented parts back together again, nor is it to selectively identify with one part and kick out other parts from your being. The goal is in fact to realize that you are simultaneously all of these parts, all of the Siamese twins, and none of them. There is also a part of you that is essentially in the middle, watching them all. Now the best way to conceptualize of this aspect of you is to think about the infinity symbol. Now you've got this point in the center, and then you've got the extremes to either side. This is a lot like the aspects of yourself that protected your vulnerability and the aspects of yourself that are vulnerable. And in between them is a self that is able to look at all of them and not completely identify with any of them, but to also help meet all of their needs. In other words, this part of you is pure awareness, which sits in the center of unconsciousness and consciousness. I am aware that this episode, being about such a wide and extensive topic, will leave you with a plethora of questions that are unanswered and a plethora of implications. Now there's a reason I'm not going to go further. It's because I want you to be pondering this concept of fragmentation within the universe throughout the week. I want you to start watching for the fragmentation within yourself and also watching for it within the world. I want you to think about the implications about this state of fragmentation within yourself and also within the world. It is, after all, the worldwide disease. Have a good week.